to the Federal Communications Commissions. Um, first, in a series of what we know will be very interesting and enlightening topics on accessibility and innovation. Um, I am Chris Monteith. I'm the Acting Chief of the FCC's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And it's my honor this morning to welcome Professor Clayton Lewis from the University of Colorado. I was just having a brief conversation with him and telling him that the University of Colorado is a fine academic institution, has many fine graduates, including myself. <laughs> and now my son, as of about a week ago. <laughs> so we're so delighted he could be with us this morning. Um, to give you uh, his full bio and some information on Professor Lewis, I welcome Jamal. Jamal, you want to come and introduce our, our guests? Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to this event. I want to say a few words about the Accessibility and in Innovation Initiative before introducing our speaker. In 2010, at the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, Prof uh, Chairman Julius Janikowski uh, launched the Accessibility and Innovation Initiative which was a recommendation in the National Broadband Plan. This was a report that Congress um, mandated the FCC uh, to give uh, to promote the availability of broadband or high-speed internet connections uh, to all Americans. And the reasoning behind this initiative is that technology is advancing at such a rapid rate it's difficult for the regulatory process to keep pace uh, in terms of um, making sure that there's adequate accessibility of these technologies. Uh, regulations are still needed, and the FCC is responsible for a number of them. Uh, but what often happens is by the time that the proper public consultation processes have occurred about an emerging technology, and what are reasonable minimum standards of accessibility. And all of the pub public comments have been analyzed and rules have been proposed and people react to the proposed rules and then final rules are adopted. Those new regulated technologies may no longer be the most relevant things that s the public is using. Um, this is something I refer to as the accessibility gap. Uh, the gap between when emerging technologies become popular and when they become accessible. So the Accessibility and Innovation Initiative is a non-regulatory approach that intends to complement the, the regulatory approach, uh, encouraging um, pro um, collaborative problem solving among people of goodwill from all sectors of society, whether academic, industry, uh, consumer, or government, um, believing that there are people out there who would like to work on solving problems of accessibility if, if there's only a, a way that um, they can get together constructively to do that. Um, and here at the FCC, we, we think we can be um, one of those facilitators. And this um, speaker series is an attempt along those lines. We hope it promotes um, good discussion. Uh, we hope the ideas uh, are stimulating and, and that people talk about them and think of ways uh, to implement those ideas. Uh, a couple of uh, logistical uh, points. Um, the uh, restrooms uh, one can get to. The hallway that's, um, that uh, is right uh, beside this room, if you step out, turn right and then take your first left and then your first left again, you'll be in a parallel hallway uh, near the guard desk and along there are restrooms. Um, between roughly 12 and 12.30 we'll have a lunch break and um, feel free to um, seek assistance from a, a, we have some limited staff will be in the hallway who could take you to the uh, the cafeteria in our building, or you could go 
outside and turn left, there's a, a store on the corner that sells sandwiches. There's also a, a pot belly not far from there. We do hope that uh, you'll return uh, to our demos in the Technology Experience Center. We have some state-of-the-art demonstrations uh, of technologies that illustrate some of the uh, themes uh, in this morning's uh, presentation. Uh, they're not uh, the only such examples. We're not endorsing those companies, but we think that they're, they're good examples of what can be done uh, with today's uh, technologies uh, to make them inclusive and accessible. So it's, it's an honor and a pleasure today to have uh, Professor Clayton Lewis joining us. Um, consistent with the collaborative spirit and, and cross-sector spirit of the ANI initiative, he brings experience uh, from industry, such as IBM, where he has worked, uh, from academia, uh, including the University of Colorado and the University of Michigan, um, and from government, uh, including the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, we have circulated uh, his bio, and I could go on at length, but he, uh, he does have honors in professional science, uh, societies related to uh, human-computer interaction. Um, he has uh, a lot of expertise in how to make uh, technologies and the world more accessible to people with cognitive disabilities. Uh, he's reflected on uh, a lot of what is needed to help close the accessibility gap. Uh, so it's, it's a real pleasure to have him. Um, please join me in welcoming Clayton Lewis for a presentation on the future of inclusive design online. Thank you, Jamal, for that uh, kind introduction. So I wonder if any of you have, have had a dream in which you find you're giving a lecture for which you're unprepared, and there are all these distinguished people in the audience. Well, I hope I'm prepared, but I am uh, humbled by the distinguished people in this, in this audience. Um, so uh, I hope I can uh, reward your attention. So thanks to all of you for... Um, uh, uh, for coming here. So one of the things that makes it a little bit easier for me is that in large part, as you'll be hearing, I'm going to be channeling the thought of T.V. Raman. Many of you know Raman, who's a distinguished computer scientist at, uh, at Google. And I, I find increasingly, as I think about the issues we're going to be talking about today, that uh, Raman's insights going back over many years uh, loom with uh, ever-increasing Im importance. So that's going to be a kind of a theme uh, here. So uh, what we'll be talking about is the emergence of a new paradigm for making information, content, and services accessible. I'll try to define for you what this paradigm is, uh, what it will mean, what are the opportunities it creates, what are the challenges it creates, and then I hope we can have a discussion of uh, how we need to respond to the emergence of this new paradigm. So I want to start with something that uh, we can call the Raman principle. There's a picture of Raman at the bottom of the screen there with his uh, guide dog. Uh, so unfortunately, as far as I could tell, Raman hasn't published what I'm going to be sharing with you here. This is something that I got uh, in a conversation with him. So, and I'll, I'll read it. It's not a direct quote, but it's the spirit of what he said. The way to think about the visual system is as a way to ask questions about a spatial database. If you give someone another way to ask the questions and get the answers, they don't need vision. So accompanying that statement and illustrating it is a demo, which again, uh, I've not been able to find that Raman has captured this demo online, which is a, which is a pity, but I'll try to... Uh, I'll try to give you the sense of it. And what, what's appearing on the screen here is a, a starter screen for a casual game, the kind of thing people play on their phones, called Jawbreaker. And in Jawbreaker, when you start the game, the screen is filled up with four different colors of balls, which I suppose originally were supposed to be like gumballs or something like that. And the, the play of the game is that you click on one of these colored balls, and a little clump of balls of the same color, however many 
balls there might be in such a clump, that clump of balls goes away and you get a, an increment to your score that depends non-linearly on the size of that clump. And what I mean by non-linearly is a little bit bigger clump that goes away all at once is worth a whole lot more points. So I won't bother you with the rest of the rules of the game, but I'll just jump to the fact that if you want to play this game at a high level, one of the things you need to do at the outset is to figure out how many balls there are of each of the colors, and in particular, which color has the most balls on the board. And the reason for that is that if you can, you want to play in such a way as to save that commonest color, get rid of all the other ones, save all the balls of that commonest color so that they form one big chunk at the end. And I guess I should have said that each time a clunk goes away, the balls kind of settle in, so they, they're always packed in there. So if you get rid of all the balls other than the blue ones, for example, there'll be just one big clump of blue balls, and when you click on that, it goes away. And the way the scoring works is having that biggest possible clump dominates everything else that you might do. Okay? So that's what you need to do. So referring back to the Raman principle there, what are the, these questions against the spatial database? Well, one of them is, which, ball, which color is commonest on this board? And if you're a sighted person and you're playing casually, you'll just kind of eyeball it, as one might say, and say, well, it looks like there's a lot of blue here, or whatever that color is. If you're more careful, you'll count, which is, again, a visual activity for a sighted person. If you're Raman, you've added to the user interface of this game a set of keyboard commands, one of which is the N key. And when you press the N key, the system speaks to you and it says there are so many blue, so many red, so many green, so many yellow. So that's a concrete illustration of the Raman principle. So before seeing that from Raman, I would have looked at the Jawbreaker game and I would have said, this is an intrinsically visual activity. It's all about colored things in configurations and you have to use a mouse and all that kind of stuff. And I would have said, you know, it's idle to think about making this activity accessible. But that's quite wrong. So following the, the Raman principle, uh, Raman, who's so blind that he commonly turns off the backlight on his laptop to save power, he can play the game. And it's because of this analysis of what's needed to do it. Does that make sense? So thinking about the implications of that, they extend beyond Gosh, you can take these casual games and, and make them accessible. This line of thinking really leads to a shift of focus about supporting activities generally. There's a tendency to think about a game like that in terms of what its presentations are, but what the Raman principle says is, no, you want to really think about what the underlying activity is, and if you do that, then you can find ways to support the underlying activity that are going to be much more inclusive. And so there's a shift here from thinking about things in terms of presentations to thinking about them in terms of content. So another idea that actually goes back farther in Raman's work to some of his earlier efforts, going back to his grad school days, he's talked for a long time about moving beyond the screen reader paradigm. And so I'm going to try to illustrate that idea here. What's on the screen is a diagram where on the left there's a, a sort of an arbitrary presentation of something or other that you need to work with and that you need to understand. And our traditional approach to supporting activities like that goes through creating a visual presentation that I'm showing a little bit to the right in the picture here. So you can imagine this is some sort of a web page or collection of web pages. It's a visual presentation of the underlying activity. And then our normal paradigm is to say, well, if you can't see that visual representation, we'll give you a screen reader. And what the screen reader will do is, in effect, translate that visual presentation into some non-visual presentation that you're in a position to work with. But this paradigm crucially goes through creating that visual presentation. And the beyond the screen reader approach says that instead, uh, or in addition conceivably, but let's focus on instead, what, what the, I've now altered the diagram so that there's a direct path 
from the underlying activity, the thing you need to understand and work with, there's a direct path from there to a non-visual presentation of that that bypasses the visual presentation. So this is one of the shifts that we want to talk about rather than approaching tasks by first of all saying, well, how would a sighted person do this? It's not that we think about that explicitly, but implicitly that's what we usually do if we're sighted people. Let's think about a representation that worked well for us, and we think, in, we think of accessibility in terms of providing access to that visual presentation. What Raman's arguing is we shouldn't do that. We should be thinking about how to provide access to the underlying activity. Going further in this direction, more recently, Raman gave a talk, and I know from having chatted with a few of you, some of you were there. So at a, a State of the Science meeting for the Interagency Committee on Disability Research, Subcommittee on Technology, uh, Raman gave a presentation in which he called out this new paradigm that we're talking about. And incidentally, uh, actually, Matt uh, Quinn, actually, this is directed especially to those of you here from the FCC. Matt's a relatively recent new colleague of yours. And I hope all of you will take the opportunity to, to meet Matt. Matt and I co-chaired the, uh, the committee that organized the, uh, uh, the, uh, the meeting at which Raman presented uh, these ideas. So an outline, the new paradigm that Raman is calling for, is that people providing content and services will not be thinking, first of all, of creating any kind of presentation of, of that material. Instead, uh, in, in Raman's form, I'm going to argue that we can have a little bit broader perspective on this, but in the form as Ram, that Raman presented it, uh, providers will create APIs, application program interfaces. So they won't be creating presentations. They'll just make it, make it possible in a programmatic way for content to be accessed. And the next step is there'll be a wide variety of client programs that are written to feed off of that API. And these clients will provide access tailored to the needs of particular users. So instead of the content provider anticipating all the particular needs that different people might have, the notion is they provide a kind of a generic programmatic accessibility. And there's a separate process in which appropriately adapted clients are created to serve the particular needs that people might have. So that's the new paradigm there. So whatever you may think about this, uh, Raman's presentation of it focuses on the advantages of doing this. We'll talk about some of the challenges that are associated with this, but let's start with the, with the good side. Because you might be thinking, gosh, if people aren't thinking about, quote, accessible presentations, unquote, you know, how's this going to work? Well, what Raman is noting is that this opens the way to providing, at least in some situations, superior access. So if you think about it, the, the traditional paradigm in which people create visual presentations and then they expect a screen reader to somehow allow people to work with that, the degree of access that you can provide is kind of bounded above by the access that a sighted person would get. And Raman's noting, well, maybe I could get better access than what sighted people have. Maybe I could have a better way of working with this material. Uh, and, and the traditional model just kind of rules that out of account right off the bat because the best you can do is to get full access to what that visual presentation provides. So part of the opportunity that Raman sees in this is that we could have better access than traditional visual access provides. Of course, non-sighted people as well as sighted people potentially could, could uh, benefit from that. So that's one of the opportunities here. Let's look at a few other examples. So uh, something that we at, at NIDER have been uh, getting interested in, uh, well, broadly, is the area of online education. So if you look at the technology landscape and what's emerging and where there are opportunities for people with disabilities, online education is a huge opportunity area, potentially. So it's easy to enumerate advantages to inclusion of the move to online education having to do with all kinds of things involving uh, uh, fewer requirements for physical mobility, the use of machine-readable representations allowing much more 
flexible presentations, all of that, but uh, those advantages are contingent. So only if online education develops in an inclusive way will these benefits for people with disabilities actually be realized. So it's important for us to understand what needs to be done there. Well, uh, one of the areas that's developing in the world of online education generally is the use of highly interactive presentations of which one flavor shown on the screen here are interactive simulations. So I'm showing you uh, sort of front pages from uh, a half a dozen physics simulations. These are part of a large collection of such simulations that my colleagues in physics at the University of Colorado have developed over, over many years. So these interactive simulations are things that educators feel may have pedagogical advantages for them, but as they are being developed up to date, they're not being developed inclusively. Uh, what are the issues? Well, these use highly visual presentations, but also the mode of interaction that's supported is mouse intensive, which of course creates challenges from a visual point of view, but also if there are people who have motor issues, interacting with these things using a mouse isn't going to isn't going to work uh, uh, for them. And until recently, people doing this work kind of had the same outlook that I had when. Raman Frisch showed me the Jawbreaker game. Say, well, you know, tough. Uh, these things are intrinsically visual. But if you look at them through the lens of the Raman principle, you'd say nothing's intrinsically visual. There's conceptual content, or should be anyway, underlying these interactive experiences. If one focuses on how that conceptual content can be exposed, then we're uh, we're in business. And I'll just note that I'm focusing here on interactive simulations, but closely related is the increasing use of games in education, which again tend to be highly visual in their conception and highly reliant on uh, mouse uh, interaction in particular. So the Raman uh, worldview encourages us to take a different look at this kind of activity and to step back from or step into step behind our sort of reflex approach, which is to think of these things as just you know highly dynamic visual kinds of things that you're interacting with in a particular way, and instead ask ourselves, what's really the content here? And I'll, I'll just make a comment that in the domain of education, uh, uh, there are further benefits to be gained besides the very considerable benefits of inclusion in thinking this way. And the argument is this, that it's, it's not hard to show, unfortunately, that many of the interactive activities that are offered for educational purposes don't, in fact, deliver educational benefit. And that's because there's a tendency for people to think, gosh, here's some complicated system. If I create a way for people to kind of fool around with this complicated system, surely they will learn something from that. Now, again, the evidence is that in many situations, that's just not true. People don't learn anything from it. This is particularly true in the case of games. So there's some convincing analyses supported by data that show that in many cases, the game framework dominates the cognitive experience. Or people are really focusing on learning to play the game and not learning the underlying conceptual structure which was being targeted by the person creating the whole thing. So a way to help correct that tendency to kind of just put things out on spec and hope that people learn something from it is to have a design discipline for these things that starts from saying, what is it we're really trying to convey here? And if that's done, that offers not only a better pedagogical or a foundation for the pedagogical work, but it also provides a good starting point for this Raman style inclusion that's oriented not at somehow making the visual activity accessible, but making the underlying, in this case, pedagogical uh, activity accessible. So here's another story about some new ideas opened up by this, this line of thinking. And this story actually starts in this very room and with at least one of the people who's in the room with us here. So sometime, and actually uh, Jamal, uh, Masrui is one of the people pictured here, and I have tried to work out when this was. It doesn't matter, of course. But anyway, a few years ago, there was an event in this room in which there was a panel up here, and uh, it had Yuta Trevoranis from uh, OCAD University and Greg Vanderheiden, who's also shown here, 
of the University of Wisconsin and, and some other people, and I don't remember what the panel was, was talking about, but in the discussion, uh, Jamal uh, Masrui uh, raised a suggestion for the technologist, it was a technology discussion, saying, you know, one of the things we really should be aiming at here is creating software tools that can be used by people with disabilities themselves to innovate and to create technology for uh, their own use and for the use of other people with with similar needs. And this is this is an idea that I agree with Jamal is extremely important and people working in this uh, uh, can get up a lot of enthusiasm in responding to the suggestion and Greg fielded the the comment for the panel and responded quite enthusiastically about yes what potential there was for this and how there was a lot of progress and how to make programming more comprehensible for people and that there was some really terrific work in visual programming that would help to make programming more comprehensible. And I've checked with both Jamal and Greg and neither of them saw the incongruity in Greg rhapsodizing about visual programming to a blind uh, programmer. But I noticed the incongruity and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did because when I was thinking about it, the Raman principle came into my mind. So the very way we describe visual programming is as if it was inherently visual, but the Raman principle says nothing is inherently visual. So, so I got the idea then that it would be productive to work on non-visual visual programming, arguing that the conceptual benefit of what people think about as visual programming and making programming easier to understand ought to be available to people who can't see as well as people who can. That is that the conceptual benefit can't be tied to the visuality of the experiences we think of it, but it must be tied to what's involved in understanding code. So a little bit about visual programming. There are different forms of it, but a common form and one that I've long been interested in is something called data flow programming. And, and this, is, this is a way of thinking about programs that's a little different from what is usual. So instead of thinking of programs as bodies of text, which is how most programming languages treat them, instead you think of programs as assemblages of what you can think of as computational units. And these units do computational work and they communicate by passing information to other units. And uh, so a data flow program is conventionally shown in a visual representation that involves a diagram of some kind. And let's see whether I've got an example here. So on the screen, it's a, it's a busy one, but I'm going to try to use it to illustrate non-visual visual programming. And I'm going to start in the middle of the screen where there's a bunch of text. And this text, for, for those of you that, that have some technical interests, uh, this is actually a, an expression in what's called JSON, JavaScript object notation. But what you can think of it is it's, it's a textual statement of the structure of a program uh, of the sort that I was just outlining to you. So there are a bunch of computational units here and the textual form describes where these computational units get their inputs and where they send their outputs. And the details don't really matter here. On the left, there's a conventional visual presentation of the very same structure. And, and uh, for those who can see it, the, the visual representation has a bunch of boxes representing the computational units. And the connections between inputs and outputs are shown by lines in a diagram. So for many people, data flow programming is the creation of programs by creating diagrams like that. Uh, you know, placing the boxes down there and connecting inputs to outputs using your mouse. But also shown kind of schematically on the right side of the screen is at least a sketch of a non-visual way of interacting with the same underlying uh, program structure that's shown in the middle there. And uh, uh, the way that works, inspired directly by uh, uh, Raman's uh, work on Jawbreaker is that there are a bunch of keyboard commands. And these keyboard commands allow you to navigate through uh, the program structure 
and operate on it in a way that doesn't involve seeing anything and doesn't involve using a mouse, because when you issue these keyboard commands, just as the Jawbreaker games told Raman what he needed to know, uh, these commands cause the system to, to tell you uh, what's going on. So I want to emphasize again here that the approach in non-visual visual programming doesn't say, here's this diagram. How are we going to allow a sighted person, a non-sighted person to somehow interact with this diagram? Instead, it says, look, there's an underlying semantic structure here, which isn't intrinsically visual. We'll, we'll provide another way to access that. And if, if I can lower your expectations sufficiently, I actually do have a demo of this system. I'm not going to subject the whole crowd to it. But if some of you are interested, I can show that to you. But uh, I'm not a professional programmer these days. And so I, I can't exaggerate how amateurish this program is. But as a proof of concept, it does work. And it is possible to create programs in a non-visual way. And just a point about this one of the places where you can see the divergence between the visual presentation and the non-visual presentation, the commands traverse the logical structure of the code, not the layout structure. And actually, creating the non-visual interface was extremely uh, uh, thought-provoking for me, because one of the things that comes from it is that there are very many considerations that when you're used to creating visual presentations, you're used to these considerations ruling your life. Things like, how big am I going to make this? What color am I going to make it? Where on the screen am I going to put it? But when you're creating a non-visual interface, you don't need to worry about any of that stuff. It's really remarkable. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to minimize uh, the, the tuning and further design work that would be needed to get between a very crude proof of concept, such as I can show now, and something that would really work smoothly. Uh, because someone who's used to visual access doesn't have good intuitions about what good non-visual access is. There's a lot of work uh, to be done there. But just right off the top, it's interesting that there's a whole lot of the task of creating a presentation that it's really liberating not to be concerned with. So all of this can be related to a bigger strategic trend uh, that I think all of us really have a big stake in in pushing. And I, I want to introduce this by going back in time to 1984. And I'm showing on the screen here a picture of John Seeley Brown. Some of you will know that name. John was uh, famously the director of the very influential Xerox Palo Alto Research Center for quite a while. He's still active, although he's retired from that role. He's uh, quite busy at USC and being a guru generally. But he's been a guru for a long time certainly going back before 1984, which is where when the story uh, I want to share with you now uh, was set. So some of you will know Don Norman. Uh, Don Norman in 1984 had some Sloan Foundation fu uh, funding and organized a, a, a really productive workshop with lots of interesting people at it, including uh, John Brown. And one of the sub-events at the workshop was one in which people were invited to share with the group their favorite recent innovation in human-computer interaction. And believe it or not, uh, this was at a time when the so-called WYSIWYG editor, what you see is what you get, was a relatively new concept. And I was in love with this idea, and so I shared this. So it takes a huge stretch of the imagination to remember a time when this could have been seen as new and novel, but believe me, it was back then. And I thought it was terrific, and so I piped up when my turn came, and I said, well, I think this WYSIWYG editor concept is a really good one. And John Brown said, Clayton, you're wrong. It's a bad idea. And I thought he was nuts. But he made the argument, which now, many years later, I realize is exactly correct. What's wrong with the WYSIWYG editor idea is that it encourages you to think not about what the content of your document is, but what it's going to look like. And that's a bad idea. Even back then, people had more abstract ideas, or at least people like John Brown had these ideas, more abstract ideas about how the content and structure of a document could be represented that were not tied to visual presentation. And he knew even back then that this was this was a bad idea. So elaborating that a little bit, so 
as, as Matt and I and others in the ICDR effort have made it our business to really understand what's happening with 508 compliance, uh, it's, it's not too much to say that the difficulties we have, and I'll say a little bit more about what some of those difficulties are, the difficulties are traceable to our making the mistake that John Brown tried to warn us against. So we've indulged ourselves over the decades with habitual practices and supporting software tools that encourage us to think of our documents in terms of what they look like. And, and here's a, a workaday example that many of you will be familiar with and then what its corollary difficulties are. So a workaday example is I'm creating a Word document and I think there should be a heading in there, so I'm sort of thinking about the structure of my document, at least to that extent. And so I say, well, I want to have a heading here. Well, what's a heading? A heading is larger font and bold. And so I type in my heading, and I increase the font size, and I make it bold, and I think I've made a heading because it looks like a heading. Well, probably everybody in this audience knows I haven't made a heading from the point of view of screen reader software that's going to try to consume that document. If I want to make a heading that the screen reader is going to recognize, I have to do it in a different way. But in my presentation way of thinking, that's an unnatural and even crazy notion. Because I've, after all, I've made something that looks like a heading. Surely I've done my job. Well, I haven't. Well, what follows from that? What follows from that is a lot of bad stuff. So you're in an agency, and, and you're somebody like Bill Peterson or Robert Baker or any of many other leaders in accessibility around the federal government, and you're, you're thinking of the responsibility that your agency has to produce accessible content on the web, and what you've got to do is to train everybody who's going to be creating something that might be seen by the public, and you've got to train them to think differently about what they do. Okay? And so you have a huge amount of managerial heavy lifting, not to mention the expense involved, a huge amount of managerial heavy lifting that's required given that people's natural orientation in producing stuff is in terms of its presentation. It's a huge hole that we've dug ourselves into. And it could be argued that there's not a really good way out of that hole, or actually I'll put it this way, there are potentially other alternatives we can discuss. But a superior one, it can be argued, is one in which we say, look, let's just not think of creating documents as creating things that look in a certain way. Let's reorient ourselves to creating content in terms of what it's, uh, or creating stuff in terms of what its underlying content and the structure of that would be. And I'll note that there's potentially a parallel benefit here to the one that I sketched with respect to the interactive simulations. That arguably our communication would be better if we oriented ourselves towards what is the content we're actually trying to convey as opposed to what's the visual effect I'm trying to create here, which is how we tend to think about things today. And I'll note that there are some things to build on. We, we don't have, this isn't something we have to start completely from scratch. So there are existing developments that kind of point in the right direction. So for those of you in the web world, there are cascading style sheets. Uh, that's a, 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 a technical facility that uh, helps us to separate presentation and content uh, in the web world. So that's a step in the right direction. Content management systems are another step. So a little comment on that. When we think about the web and when we think about web accessibility, uh, there's a tendency for us to picture in our mind's eye a web page being crafted as an individual entity. And it's, it's possible for web content to be created that way, so some of it is. But I've, I've never actually done the sample, but I'm confident that a fair sample of what's on the web today would show that it's a minority of pages that are created that way. The majority of pages are actually automatically generated uh, using content that's stored in a more abstract form. An underexploited opportunity in the world of accessibility is making sure that those content management system delivery paths are made more inclusive. So there's some work going on on that front. So if you look at the major content management system platforms, you'll see that 
uh, typically, maybe even universally now, the major ones have sort of sub-activities aimed at creating accessible templates. But uh, measuring the investment against the need, it's, there's, st there's still an area of inadequate investment. People are not putting as much attention into that as they really ought to. Uh, but even, while there is progress being made, I think we really ought to be beating ourselves up about this because it's been a long time since 1984 and we're still not getting what John Brown was arguing we should get. So we can go further and as uh, Jamal mentioned, uh, one of my uh, technical interests uh, has to do with cognitive access. So how can we uh, make uh, content and services more available to people uh, who have uh, cognitive limitations. So I'm, I'm showing diagrammatically here two things. So one, across the middle of the diagram, I've got some kind of a task somebody needs to perform on the left. And then again, conventionally we think, all right, let's create some kind of web page that provides somebody access to that underlying task. And then we're hoping that somebody looks at that web page and, and they can understand something about it. So this is kind of the traditional view. And what corresponds to the sort of screen reader approach is to imagine ways in which we can somehow take that web page that we created and, and make it easier for somebody to understand that web page. And what I'm trying to uh, suggest in the diagram is kind of parallel or very much parallel to the earlier presentation, a sort of a bypass path that says, nope, let's not get hung up on what that web page is and how people are going to interact with that web page, let's really think about the interaction that we want somebody to have with the underlying task. And actually, let me, let me pause here because I think I didn't put in a, a slide on this. So to be clear, I'm not at all trying to suggest here that there's nothing that can be done uh, in a kind of a web page centric way. So there are things you can do if you want to make that web page easier to understand. So a couple of them are, uh, you can make it easy, easier than it typically is now, for somebody to get that web page read to them because uh, some people with cognitive limitations uh, will be helped by having text read to them. That is, they can understand the text, but they have difficulty processing the text themselves to extract the understanding uh, from it. And so making it possible for them to use uh, text-to-speech conversion is something that can be quite helpful for some people. Another thing that's helpful for some people is extracting an outline view of a page. So people who have difficulty comprehending a complex structure may find it easier if you kind of break it down and allow them to see the high-level structure of the page or the content on the page and then allow them to zero into a portion of it. So those are examples of things that can be done uh, in the web page centric view. But what I want to call attention to here is what can be done pursuing the theme of this presentation, which is talking more about how to help people in their engagement with the underlying content, not worrying about somehow stopping off at a web page on the way. So here, I want to uh, draw some thoughts from somebody that I know, uh, many of you in the office know, Bob Williams, who's an associate uh, commissioner in the Social uh, Security uh, Administration. And uh, actually, we at NIDA are, are hoping to get some cooperative work going with, with Bob and also uh, Deborah Kaplan, and many of you know. Uh, Deborah and I have, have uh, tried to uh, frame some work that we, we hope to uh, uh, be able to develop in this space. But some of the ideas are, are really coming from Bob's thinking. So uh, much of uh, the communication that uh, Social Security has with its clients has to do with services and programs and their eligibility. And uh, it's a complex space, as anybody in Washington knows. You know, the way policy evolves, it's, you know, there's only occasional bouts of rationalization at rare intervals. Uh, uh, and most of the time what's happening is kind of accretion. So, you know, let's, let's have some new program in addition to ones that, that we already have. And so the result is you have a very complex uh, uh, policy space. And so this is a challenge for anybody, but certainly somebody who has uh, difficulty processing complex uh, structures, that here you have this, this very large uh, collection of, of programs that have uh, 
differing eligibility, uh, differing purposes and the like. It's just an extremely complex space to negotiate for anybody. So uh, Bob points to some work on something that's called choice architecture that's an effort to really present alternatives to people in such a way that it makes it easier for them to make the right choice. And part of this involves biasing in certain ways, which is not unproblematic in all contexts, but to find a way to present things so that the way alternatives are presented, it steers people to the choices that are most likely to be the best ones for them. Uh, so that does seem like a really good starting point, at least, for thinking about this kind of problem. One that's uh, a little bit more of a slam dunk uh, is, is personalization. So if you're a client of Social Security, and if you can identify yourself as a client when you're interacting with the agency, notice how much simpler your interaction can be. Because of this wide range of programs, the chances are you're eligible for only a small number of them. But with the traditional kind of website, they've got to put out all the things that are available to you because they don't know who you are. And so they don't know what your eligibility, what, what you're eligible for and what you're not eligible for. But if instead they have, they use an approach which they are in fact moving to where you authenticate when you go to the website, they can access information about you and present to you only those programs that are actually relevant to you in the sense that you're eligible. So these are examples. And again, note that neither of these involves, gee, we've got this web page that we've provided for ordinary people, and let's, let's see what we can do to help somebody access what's on that ordinary web page. Instead, this says, let's, let's push back to what is the underlying interaction we're really trying to support here, and how can that underlying interaction be made uh, easier for people to carry out. So there are some challenges here, as maybe are already apparent uh, uh, to you. So here's one uh, that arises here. So think about uh, Section 508 and the obligation it creates for agencies. So what it says is that when agencies create presentations, they need to create inclusive presentations, one that ones that will be accessible to the, the widest uh, uh, range of, of consumers. But if Raman is right about this new paradigm, agencies won't be creating presentations. They'll be making it possible for other people to create presentations, but they won't be creating presentations. They'll just be creating APIs. Who's responsible for the meeting the public policy purpose of providing actual access for actual citizens out there. And in case you think I'm just kind of inventing problems here, uh, there's a real life example of this that, that I ran into in my, in my work at NIDR. And the illustration involves the, the VA blue button system that uh, many of you will know about. And blue button these days has many facets to it, but to keep things simple, in its original form, what uh, Blue Button did was to provide a dump of your medical records. So you're a veteran, you've got a history in the VA and military hospital system, and you have many purposes in civilian life for having access to that information. And this used to be a huge challenge to provide any meaningful kind of access to that, and the Blue Button system provides an elegant solution to that challenge because what you can get is a plain text dump of all of those records. Now, when I first heard about this, I thought, what incredibly Neanderthal conception is this? Who could possibly want to have a plain text dump of all that information? That's useless. How are you actually going to access it? And I can't remember whether it had to be explained to me or whether it dawned on me what's going on there. But it's actually a brilliant idea because the point isn't that any human being is going to be consuming all that plain text. The point is people are going to write client programs that process that plain text information and allow you to interact with it in a way that's meaningful to you. 
So although this doesn't involve an API, or at least only a very simple one, nevertheless, I think it fits this new paradigm that Raman is talking about. Because what it's saying is that the agency is not providing a presentation of the content. It's providing a basis on which maximally flexible presentations can be created by third parties. So I got into this with Peter Levin, who was the CIO of the VA when the Blue Button system was developed. And I was meeting with him in my role at NIDR because I went through a time there of talking with people all over Washington about uh, potential activities that it could explore the benefits of something called, uh, which I'll come back to a, a little bit in a minute, uh, something many of you know about the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure Initiative. So this is a scheme for providing personalized access to web pages um, in, in a particular way. And, and we at NIDR developed, funded the development of this, uh, of this concept. We're very interested in finding opportunities to partner with other agencies to explore applications of this idea. And it, and it seemed to me, having heard a little bit about Blue Button, that the, the VA might be interested in a partnership of this kind. But in the conversation with Levin, it emerged, well, Levin thought GPI would be a great idea, but there wasn't a role for the VA in it. Why? Because the VA wasn't creating any of the clients that people would use to actually access the blue button data. They weren't even funding. Not only were they not creating them, they weren't funding them. So in this way of doing it, there's a third party ecosystem not funded by the VA that's actually creating the clients. So you can see what the challenge there is if things continue to move in that direction. An agency can legitimately say, well, we've met our 508 obligations. Indeed, there is no 508 obligation on this particular transaction. And because we're not funding the development of any of these clients, it's not up to us to worry about making them accessible. So something to think about. There's another challenge that we have to meet if indeed the, mo the world is moving in this direction. As we can see, the VA is a real life example of it's happening. Those of you that follow their other initiatives, if you look at you know the big push on open data, you can recognize what Raman is talking about there as well. Uh, the notion again is agencies don't think about exactly what about all these data is the public interested in. Instead they say, Let's make it as flexibly accessible in, in the broad sense so that the public and third parties can do whatever they can extract, whatever information or whatever value they want from these things. So again, that's a, another illustration of the direction that Raman is talking about. But if this is all going to work out, uh, this emphasis on uh, content uh, uh, rather than presentation there, there, there are two separate developments in the world of software that we really need to promote. So one, just returning to the John Brown point, we really need to start developing tools for publishing content rather than the appearance of content. So we're documents and PDFs, something to think about. What would tools like that be like? But connecting with the, with the, uh, with the blue button story and this, this new uh, uh, emerging approach that Raman is talking about, it's obviously of the first importance that it become much easier than it is today for these clients to be produced. So when some body of data that people have an actual interest in comes into being, it's got to be easy and cheap for clients that allow that access that's no longer being provided directly by the agency. It's got to be easy and cheap for appropriately inclusive clients to be uh, created. And I'll just note that this overlaps a lot with the challenge that Jamal put out in the conversation that I told you about before. So these tools are the, are the kinds of things that we need to put into the hands of people with disabilities, ideally, so that they're not having to wait around for other people to create the kind of access uh, that they need. I'll, I'll also just note that this direction connects with other trends that are playing out in society that I'm, I'm sure uh, some of you are, are following. And, and these are big deals, and, and you know we, we could talk a lot about these things as well. So some people are arguing that we're entering a fundamental shift in how industrial production is carried out. 
that we're leaving the age of mass production in which we've been living and we're entering the age of mass customization. And the kind of symbol of this change is what's called the 3D printer, where instead of having elaborate custom tooling that's hugely expensive that can turn out millions of identical widgets, instead we'll have programmable tooling that can economically produce one-of-a-kind devices. So you could see these clients as kind of the software equivalent or counterpart to this change in, in physical uh, production. I'll just note that, that uh, something that uh, we can connect this to is the emergence of maker culture. So this is, this is mostly today in the kind of physical world, or a little bit in the, in the sort of hardware software kind of uh, boundary. But one way we can translate Jamal's call into maker culture terms is that Jamal is saying we really need to be promoting a maker culture for software. So that instead of people being in the role of mass consumers, hoping that the mass producers of software will produce stuff that works for them, instead we enter the sphere of mass customization in which it's possible and routine for people to get software that's highly tuned to their individual needs. And if, and if you think back to uh, one of Raman's first level points about what's good about all of this, I think you can see that in a customization environment, people can obtain actually superior access, or one could perhaps say just superior ability to work, uh, given their functional strengths and weaknesses, than is ever going to be delivered by in the, in the world of mass production of software. There's some progress on this front that I wanted to call attention to. So I'd mentioned the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure Initiative. Uh, if you're interested, you can read about that at uh, gpii.net. So there are many facets to this, but one facet is there's work within that initiative on new approaches to developing software, especially software in the, in the web world. And uh, this new approach puts enormous emphasis on the configurability of software. So those of you that work in software know that software has always embodied a, a, a very vexing paradox. So on the one hand, there's practically nothing that's as flexible as software. But at the same time, there's practically nothing that's as difficult to modify, maintain, and uh, and, and work with as, as software. And what it has to do with is uh, the complexity of it. So uh, you, can, you can get software to do anything you want, but getting it to do that involves creating some of the most, if not the most, complex artifacts ever created by people. And now you turn around and you say, well, I've got this enormously complex artifact, and I'd like it to do something slightly different. Well, good luck. Okay, it's really hard to do that. Well, there's a group within the, uh, the GPII initiative that's really working on this problem of how software can be rethought to make it much more configurable than it is now. And, and there are a couple of key concepts in doing that. So one is rethinking software and putting it on the basis of declarative specifications rather than code. So uh, the argument is that many of the reasons programs as we think of them today are so difficult to modify has to do with the very complex way that different pieces of code interact. So it's very brittle. And uh, the argument is that declarative representations can be made more robust so that you can, you can more freely make modifications to them, to parts of them without breaking uh, the whole thing that you're dealing with. And going along with that, are ways of operating on these declarative representations of programs so that you can do things like merge programs. So given a program that does one thing you're interested in and a related program that does something else you're interested in, to make it more likely that you can combine those two programs in a way that will provide you with both of those of those uh, benefits. And I'll just comment that uh, this, this work is, is very important to what we can hope is a kind of an evolving ecosystem of, of code. So if, if you think about this era of mass customization, it's going to happen all the time that Ben Schneiderman has modified you know, some vanilla underlying structure to provide some feature of value to him. 
I've separately modified the underlying structure that we both of us got from somewhere else, but to provide some other feature that's of interest to me. And then it turns out we're, we're both quite interested in each other's enhancements. So today, there's not really a good way for us to get together on that. But in this world of declarative specification, the ambition at least is that uh, making some assumptions about the underlying compatibility of these enhancements, that it should be possible and it should be relatively simple for him and me to put what we have together and come up with something that really unifies the advances that we've, that we've, both, uh, that we've both made. And uh, if, if you're interested in that, uh, this is under the aegis of something called the Fluid Project, uh, which is based at OCAD University in Toronto, uh, website fluidproject.org. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. And if you're interested and you have trouble finding this particular stuff, you could email me, and I can try to provide you with a pointer. OK. So how do we need to respond to these challenges? I, and I want this to set up in, in part for a possible discussion that some of you uh, might have. But uh, I do think, at a minimum, we need to be thinking about that policy implication that I raised. So we don't want to have it be the case that the shift in the direction that Raman is talking about means that we drop the ball on our public policy purposes. And I guess one, one challenge that's involved there is that we have public policy purposes that today are served by Section 508, and I don't mean to say that that's unproblematic, but at least in principle, we can see how Section 508 serves the public policy aim of inclusion. But if we see the shift that Raman is talking about, if we see this really becoming more of a reality, it's already somewhat a reality now, but if this were to become the dominant paradigm, uh, the fear that I have is that we find, gee, we still presumably have that same public policy aim, but the policy instrument we relied on to deliver on that public policy aim no longer delivers on it. So how are we going to do that? And, it, and it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, I think, a, an interesting thing to think about, but something that, that we've got to find a way to, uh, to think about. And then I'll, I'll just note, um, actually, some of you might know Blake Reed, who was around Washington, and I think at least some of the time participating in FCC events. He's these days back at uh, University of Colorado, heading up the technology law clinic at the uh, University of Colorado Law School. Uh, Blake is noting, and this is something that people are raising really with respect to many of the things we're talking about, including more traditional approaches. Uh, accessibility involves content transformation in ways that raises issues for intellectual property law. And the Raman move is saying that maybe that's going to get even more so. And so I think Blake and other attorneys would say we already in the accessibility community need to be really thinking about those intellectual property challenges and how we may need to adjust our intellectual property frameworks further. We've already made some progress on recognizing accessibility as a special priority with respect to intellectual property law. Again, the, the issue is, is what has to do with transformational uses or derivative uses. If I own a body of content, then in, in current intellectual property, I, I acquire thereby the right to limit what you can do with it, to transform it. And unfortunately, uh, at least in principle, accessibility-related transformations can be covered by that. And so the stakes are maybe going to get even higher there. And then, as I hope I've, I've motivated for you, I think we've got to put a priority on uh, promoting as much as we can the advances in software tools, going back to uh, Jamal's challenge, how can we empower people with disabilities to really shape their own technical environment? And that was already something that would have been desirable to do. But if Raman is right about where we're going, it becomes that much more important to do that. So I want to uh, do some th thank you. So on the screen, I've pictured uh, people I've mentioned in the talk, uh, Bob Williams, uh, TV Raman, of course, Antronik Bosman, who's actually one of the people working on that work in the, in the fluid uh, project and, and somebody who's influenced me a lot. Uh, Greg Allen, actually, is Greg in the room by any chance? Anyway, Greg Allen, Chief Data Officer of the FCC, is also somebody who's influenced my thinking a lot. I mentioned Blake Reed, uh, Greg Vanderheiden, and, and of course, uh, Jamal uh, Masrui. And then I want to close with a, a slide that might seem to be irrelevant, but it isn't really. So what this is showing is a, 
actually I have a cribbed a propaganda poster showing a robust, tanned uh, Chinese farm worker holding aloft a little red book that's labeled www, and the caption is just say no to native apps. And how does this connect in? Well, I feel that those of in, is in government especially, but not only in government, have a special need to promote the, the health and vigor of the web infrastructure ecosystem. And the reason is that it offers by far the best avenue to platform independence in our development and delivery of online content and services. And it's in constant tension with the ecosystem of native apps, that is apps that run only on iPhone or only on Android or whatever. And if you're in a federal agency, there's a huge amount at stake there. The difference between being able to develop whatever you want to provide to the uh, public in a single way and have it be broadly useful to the public or instead take on the burden of saying, well, we developed this great iPhone app and next week we'll develop a great Android app and the week after that we'll develop a Windows mobile app and on and on and on and on. And uh, the, the, the difference in, in cost and in inclusion are, of enormous for, uh, are enormous for doing that. So if you think about the larger argument here about the software ecosystem, we all need, in my view, we all need to put our backs behind creating as much as possible a unified software infrastructure so that all of the tools that we're talking about here can be leveraged instead of having to imagine that we're going to replicate a framework of this general kind across many different platforms. So thanks for your attention. And we've got, I'm happy to say, plenty of time to talk about uh, all of this. So well, I look forward to that. Thank you, Clayton. Um, for people uh, listening online, let me uh, or watching online, let me say that uh, you can send a question uh, to the following email address: AII Speaker at FCC.gov, AII Accessibility and, and Innovation Initiative. Uh, you can also use the hashtag on Twitter, AII Speaker. Um, let me also, uh, anybody in the room, feel free to, to, to raise your hand if, if you have a, a question. We'll, we'll bring a mic to you. Uh, let me take this chance to, to thank the people in the Accessibility and Innovation Initiative uh, who have helped to make this happen. Uh, Rebecca Lockhart, uh, Kelly Jones, Susan Fasen, Aaron Vimont, uh, and the key members of the management team at the FCC who've made this happen, uh, Susan McLean, Roger Goldblatt, Karen Strauss, and Chris Monteef. So actually, if, if you'll indulge me in a little professorly behavior here, what I'd like to ask you to do before diving immediately into the Q&A is take a moment to talk with those near you, introduce yourselves if you haven't done that, take advantage of the fact that you, you both came to this event, uh, but also chat for a second about what we're talking about here. Uh, and, and to see what questions there are. So I, I hasten to say that the point of my asking you to do that is, is not to diminish the number of questions, but actually to increase them. Because y you might be thinking, well, I, I'd be thinking about asking X, but I, I must be the only person in the audience who cares in the least about X. Whereas if you talk with somebody near you, you'll find out that they too are really interested in X. So just take a moment to do that, if, if you would, please. Okay, stop thinking. So 
So anybody have any questions, complaints, arguments, rebuttals? OK, there's, there's some over here. I guess there are mics going around. And actually, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself as part of the question, that'd be great. I'm Ryan Hello. Harvey. Um, I'm at OMB. Um, I have a question. One of the things that I guess uh, has troubled me about this, um, I firmly support the idea of the API as the content and you know any number of clients that are customized. Um, I think the problem with that with that is is how you incentivize outside companies, businesses who are thinking about different things or thinking about marketability and those kinds of things. Um, you know, how how do you create the environment uh, in which these different clients get produced for the users that need them? Um, and related to that, I'll say I disagree with the native apps thing because I think the native apps are just yet another client. Okay, so actually, let me take the the, the second one first. Um, the native apps are indeed just other clients, and in the best of all possible worlds, um, if we could if we could make the creation of them uh, sufficiently uh, economical and flexible, and all the rest of it. Yep, actually, that's that's an argument I I hadn't thought about, but I think you're right. If we could make everything work perfectly, then among other problems, maybe we would we would solve this one. In the world as as we are now, as long as agencies are are trying to support. Um, uh, are, are trying to support the delivery of, of presentations. We've got that to worry about. But I guess, actually, again, going, sorry to be doubling back and forth here. Uh, in the native app world, we have to worry about creating not just one uh, environment for making it easy to create clients, but we have to have many of them. And maybe that could be brought about. But it seems to me it's more likely we could imagine promoting that ecosystem in, in the case of the of the web. So. Yeah, you've you've put your, your you've put your finger on the worry. Uh, how are we going to incentivize people to produce that stuff? And uh, I've had uh, I've had just a few thoughts about it, but mostly what I thought is, you know, somebody Eve Hill or somebody uh, needs to convene some people to really think about this stuff. Because if, if Raman is right, it's going to happen. And there are signs, as I've mentioned, it already is happening. So it seems that if we've got to be thinking about what the approaches would be. Just taking rough stabs, what if we had a policy that said, uh, gee, we're going to be making government data freely available for all the reasons that are motivating to do that. But if you are going to become a consumer or a, a repackager of those data, then you assume the public policy obligation of providing inclusive access, but that's that's at best a stab at a uh, at, at a solution. And one could imagine other ones. One could imagine, you know, direct subsidy incentives of of one kind or another. Uh, but just to reiterate, I'd say we have twin challenges there. So we have the technology challenge. It won't matter what we do with policy if it remains difficult for these flexible. Uh, uh, Clients to be created. No, no amount of policy push is going to uh, bring bring those things into existence in the technology environment we have now. The costs are just too high, so we have technology challenges. But you're right; we've got to worry about what's going to motivate people to uh, 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 to use that. Clear issues. Let's see who's who's managing the mics. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, I've got somebody queued up. Um, Lisa Wilcox, USDA ERS. Um, we're one of those agencies that actually just really recently released our content as APIs. So we're trying to move forward as far as like separating out that that content from you know from the visual structure. But our challenge is we're also one of those agencies that generates a lot of Word documents, Excel files, and PDFs because we generate a lot of data. And you know we we are trying to restructure that data by utilizing and leveraging our APIs. But the challenge is, how do we do that in an inclusive manner? And then my other my second thought to piggyback on what you were just saying too is, 
I'm surprised with, with the great uh, digital innovation fellows that we have and, and the innovation uh, strategy that the government released that inclusive design wasn't part of that. Well, I can I can get behind all of all of those points, and actually I'll say that I'm I'm glad that as you're participating in this movement that you're worrying about the consequences of doing it. Um, and, of course, worrying about it doesn't mean that, that we're able to come up with appropriate solutions, but you're underscoring the importance of, of trying to get out in front on this. So if, if, we, if we go back to uh, Jamal's framing in terms of an accessibility gap, this potentially is a big one uh, that, you know, we're, we're making this change in how we're communicating with the public and we're not thinking about how to make it all work in an inclusive manner. So Zuhair up front. This is Zuhair Mahmoud with the Library of Congress. I want to go back to the earlier point you uh, have defined, if I understand correctly, as the Raman principle, which is eva imagining visual communication as though it's a way to make a database query and that there are other ways of accessing the same information that are not necessarily visual. And I find it fascinating that you brought that up, and, and mine is more in the nature of a comment than a question. Um, having studied calculus and, and physics and a whole lot of subjects that are visual, I used to think that way, but I think as of late, the question that uh, came into my mind is, yes, although that is technically true, you have to worry about efficiency. I could sit down and tell you the points on the graph of f of x equals x squared, uh, but you could just look at it within literally um, you know, a quarter of a second and tell exactly what it's like, whereas I would have to listen to all of the points that you plotted, and it might take quite a while to actually put that picture together. Now, actually, you know, f of x equals x squared is a fairly simple function, but when you get into dif you know, difficult and complex design concepts, I wonder if that principle really does hold true. I wonder if some things are inherently visual and just cannot be accessed any other way. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm interested in your example because I, I would be inclined to turn it around. So you're right. If you're expected to access this curve by reflecting on a bunch of points, um, you're not going to get there. But when, if you look at, at the underlying pedagogy of things like that, what people are encouraged to develop is concepts like asymptote and directrix and inflection point and other higher level ways of characterizing curves where Cited or non-cited, you're encouraged to move away from the level of what the individual collection of points is to a higher level characterization. And so going back to the point I made before about people thinking more deeply about the pedagogy involved, if, if people think more about what it is about these curves that's conceptually important, then I think you have something, arguably, that offers benefit to cited and, as well as, uh, as, as non-cited uh, users. Whether there are things that are in, intrinsically uh, visual, I think is, is an interesting point to argue, and, and actually a, a really thorough analysis of it might be really productive. In the, in the short run, I think it's one of those principles where it's worth taking as a working hypothesis that there aren't any such things. Because if you make the other hypothesis, which is one we all walk around with, you end up not even trying to find productive ways of presenting information, just as I wouldn't have even tried to make Jawbreaker accessible. And of course, it doesn't, it's neither here nor there whether Jawbreaker is accessible, but with respect to your calculus course, it matters a huge amount. So again, really thinking about what the somatic structures are separate from their visual form I think is a productive idea. And you, you could be right that we might run into things which are extremely difficult or conceivably even impossible uh, to deal with in, in non-visual ways. But as a working hypothesis, I, I think it, it makes sense to uh, uh, see how far we can, we can get. You wanted to respond. Great. Can we get the mic back? Yeah. I mean, as a follow-up, uh, definitely, you know, that you'd want to try, but I think that the variable that tends to be forgotten in these arguments is the efficiency. 
uh, ultimately, you may take very challenging concepts that are visual and try to describe them in an unvisual fashion. But again, you, you sort of have to look at, if you look at a complex chart and somebody that's accessing it visually can easily infer or find out what is on that chart. Whereas, again, no matter how you describe it, um, it, it will take a little bit uh, of, of time. It'll take a little bit longer. So I guess what I'm trying to say, the long way of trying to say it, is um, where accessibility to visual information can be done non-visually, I think the efficiency and speed factor has to be considered um, you know, during that discussion. And I think sometimes, while theoretically, you can make something that's visual, uh, presentable in an unvisual fashion, but the efficiency factor may just make it unwieldy and, and, and inaccessible to, to you know, some or many or however uh, you know, many people might be impacted by that. Okay, well, Next. I'll continue to be argumentative, at, at least for a while. So two things triggered, triggered by that. So one is, and actually I don't think, is Kathy McCoy here? Kathy is actually joining us at NIDER. Uh, she's a professor in computer science at the University of Delaware. Uh, and uh, she and I will be consulting jointly at NIDER. And I know she's going to be here uh, later today, but I don't think she's able to make it for the talk. So Kathy and her students have been doing a lot of work on extracting descriptions from the sort of graphics that appear in USA Today. And uh, they're actually making pretty good progress. But I think there's a reflection uh, very much related to your point, which is that when somebody creates one of those graphics, they are starting with some idea about the point they want to make. And then what they're publishing is not the point they want to make, but some graph from which a person who can see can perhaps extract that point. So in in parallel with Kathy's efforts to kind of recover from that by looking at the graph and trying to recover what the point was, I think another thing that we ought to be doing is having a mode of publication where people publish the point, and uh, which would be more efficient, actually, even for sighted people. And actually, there was a study that John Anderson and uh, uh, actually a couple of, of, of lines of work, but actually, I guess the one I want to refer to is um, is uh, work of John Payne, who at the time was a graduate student at, at Carnegie Mellon University. And, and if you'll indulge me, I'll tell you a short anecdote about this. So John presented a study at the CHI conference uh, many years ago now, in which he compared two online courses. And one version of the online course was a very ordinary, largely text-oriented presentation. And the other one had all the multimedia bells and whistles uh, activated with interactive simulations and videos and all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that was elegant about the study was that the framework included pre-existing assessments. This was content in cell biology. So there were unit tests already available uh, for this particular content. So they're able to do a direct comparison between this very stodgy textual presentation and this whiz-bang multimedia presentation. And the result was that uh, learning was about equal in the two cases, but the multimedia content took considerably longer to consume. Well, in the room when Payne was giving his presentation, there were lots of angry and uncomprehending people who had invested a lot in interactive multimedia presentations and were certain that Payne couldn't possibly be right. So during the talk, the queue of people at the microphone to ask questions got longer and longer. And, and my favorite questioner said something like this. He said, it's obvious what's going on here. You had bad multimedia. That's why your multimedia didn't work better. Okay? And your mistake was you just didn't have the right help in developing that. Now, if you'd had Brad Myers, who's a faculty member at CMU, if you'd had Brad working on it, the results would have been completely different, which gave John the opportunity to say, well, as a matter of fact, Brad's my thesis advisor. So... <laughs> So, in fact, it was really good multimedia. But what that, and, and there are other things that you could point to, including work by John Anderson, shows that in, in many cases, figuring out what it is you want to communicate to somebody and saying it works really well. I was going to 
I was going to take a quick moment to ask a uh, question from, from email. This comes from Todd Weisenberger from the University of Iowa. And he says, we often find that developers and project stakeholders here have spent much time of their careers in WYSIWYG and visual development paradigms, and we are change averse. How can we champion these ideas in academia? Hmm. Narcotics. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's the... I'm, I'm speechless, as you can tell. Okay, so actually something I didn't allude to that's, that's helping us out. So I mentioned CSS and content management systems. Another thing that's really helping, and it's the sort of thing that if, if we want as, as government agencies to do things to kind of push things along, we should be taking advantage of it. Uh, the advent of mobile devices is doing a lot of good in these respects. So if we were to contrast a typical book page on Amazon as I would get it on my laptop and as I would get it on my Android phone, it's, a, it's dramatically different. And it's, it's dramatically different in the direction of simpler, less elaborate, less fancy presentations. So the constraints of, of mobile devices are pushing us to get more serious about what our communication goals are. And actually, I'll, I'll just uh, comment that uh, some people have said, gee, look at that cluttered Amazon screen or that cluttered Yahoo screen or whatever cluttered screen it is. And they'd say, you know, that's just bad design. You know, people are being lazy. Well, in some ways, life would be simpler if that were true. But uh, actually, that's good design uh, measured according to the objectives of the organizations producing those things. And actually, Tom Landauer uh, d did some of the early uh, work on this showing that for typical users, for typical users, cramming as much stuff onto one screen as you can is actually the right way to go. And when you look at commercial organizations who do a huge amount of A-B testing, you can be sure that they've, they've shown that what Landauer is, is saying is correct. And so, so when, you're, when you're designing for typical users, you're designing for complexity, basically, when you have the screen space to play with. So the fact that now there are important reasons why people need to design for smaller screen formats, that pushes us in the right direction. So uh, so one might say in response to the, the questioner that orienting ourselves increasingly towards design of small screen devices is likely to be constructive in this respect because lots of things that we think we want to do, uh, you, you just can't do it. So you have to kind of buckle down and think about what's really important here and what's a really economical way that I can present that rather than in, indulging all the bells and whistles. But that's, that's at, at best, a, a parcel response. So well worth thinking a lot more about how we change all of our thinking. Who's, um, who's managing the mics? Right here. Okay. Incentivizing the client uh, might be possible if somebody creates a great app that people download and give good reviews. You could compensate them, and that would be a lot more cost-effective than a more bureaucratic approach. More difficult is incentivizing the content producers who attach advertisements to the presentation to get the revenue. And if they produce an accessible, stripped-out version, that could be used by others to create a version that has no advertisement but is otherwise the same. Yeah, interesting points, both of them. So yeah, I like the idea of uh, at least, again, my argument would be we, sh we should really have an open kind of policy brainstorm uh, kind of thing, because I, I, I don't think we, it's going to be obvious how to, how to deal with this, but I, I think what, what you say is right about uh, the potential power of incentives. The thing about advertising is, is interesting. Uh, so actually, I was just talking, I can't remember with whom recently, maybe one of my students, Jeff Hale, that um, the, actually Jeff is, is doing some work on uh, uh, using advertising suppression, actually, to simplify web presentations for, for people who benefit from that. And his observation is that the, the advertising ecosystem as it is now is remarkably tolerant of ad suppression. Uh, so there's a little bit of an arms race there, but not as much as you'd think. 
and and apparently the the broad reasoning would be that that hardly anyone's going to really figure out how to use ad suppression, and so they don't really need to worry about it. But I guess we do have to worry if if we succeed in creating a, an ecosystem in which ad suppression becomes much easier than it is now. Uh, you know, stepping back, uh, we may all live to regret uh, developing an advertising-sponsored technological infrastructure, which we've made big steps towards doing. And you can argue generally that this is just another illustration of how you always get in trouble when you live in a world of cross-subsidies, because you're not paying for what you really want. You're paying for something else, and, and so misalignments uh, uh, develop. But nevertheless, that's, that's clearly the world we're in, and so we, we have to worry about that. For sure. Hi, I'm Audra Hale Maddox. I'm an attorney here. And um, what I wanted to ask about is that your basic question of how do we make this task easier sort of presumes that efficiency is a constant good. And for most sort of conveyances of information, that's true. I mean, most government agencies are trying to get the most information across the most efficiently. There's no point in spending an hour figuring something out if you can spend 10 minutes. But arts and cultural institutions frequently aren't doing that at all. Um, you know, the Louvre could pile all of their blockbusters in the first room and then have an exit. And you could whip through them all in half an hour and say, I did the Louvre. But that's not the point. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at stuff like with Raman adopting or adapting Jawbreaker, you have to ask, just because we can, should we? Is Jawbreaker entertaining for someone who can't see it? If they have sort of a calculator that helps figure it out, does that still accomplish entertainment for that person, given that right. frequently we process entertainment as an amiable way to spend our time. Yeah, so all really interesting points, so responding to a few of them. Uh, so one is, I don't actually know whether uh, if, if we could peer into Raman's life that we find that whenever he has a spare moment, he's playing Jawbreaker. I'm a little skeptical that he is, but, uh, but, but on the other hand, I, I think that Broadly, his experience of it is comparable to that that a sighted person would have. So if he's not doing it, I think it's probably because he's, he's not that kind of uh, person. But uh, another comment I'll make, I was interested to see when I was looking at a recent jawbreaker that I downloaded, that which is, I'm sure, designed entirely with sighted people in mind. Lo and behold, they've got an option to do exactly what Robin's keyboard command does. So, so the designers evidently have decided that it doesn't do violence to the concept of the game to allow somebody not to have to count the stuff. So for whatever that's worth. The, your, your broader point about artistic and cultural activities is, is really, uh, really interesting and, and deserves a lot of thought that we won't be able to get into here. But I'll just sh share one recent reflection on that. So I was at a really interesting meeting over the weekend uh, called the Deep uh, conference at OCAD University in, in Toronto. And DEEP stands for something like, uh, well, it's, it's, it's basically um, uh, in, inclusive development and, and policy uh, reflections. I, I apologize, I can't unpack the, uh, uh, the acronym. So th there was one session having to do with audio description in, in, in broadcast and new media. And in that discussion, the, the question of audio descriptions for YouTube emerged because somebody noted that every week there's more content put on YouTube than has been produced by all of broadcast media in, for, since the year one. So there's this huge quantity of consumer produced uh, video there. Uh, you'll know that there's quite a bit of progress towards providing captioning for YouTube. And actually, I was, I was learning just last night from uh, Josh Mealy of Smith Kettlewell Institute that they've got some exciting work on crowdsourcing of captioning, I'm sorry, of audio descriptions as a way of kind of filling that gap. But we were led in that discussion more to your point about the kind of cultural and artistic significance of things uh, to fantasize a bit about a change in how people think about what they're doing when they put things on YouTube. And the example that came to my mind is, you know, it's one of the things I've looked at at YouTube, and you all may know this, that there are a lot of videos on YouTube where people have taken cornstarch solution, which is a 
Newtonian fluid and has lots of interesting mechanical properties. So there are lots of videos showing what happens when you put cornstarch solution on a vibrating plate and you get these dancing fingers and stuff like that. So let's take that as a paradigmatic YouTube contribution. So people do that as a very spontaneous kind of thing. What would it be like to model another use of that medium where you did some of the things we were thinking about? So you thought about what experience you hoped people would have when they watched your video, and, and you built an audio description into your conception of the, let's call it, work of art. So it'd be different for sure from what we're thinking about now, but I could imagine a world in which that kind of ethic of artistic creation might become dominant. You know, we might be thinking, and actually you, you can point to things in the, in the real world of art. And actually I was reading some stuff recently about the sort of changing role, the evolution of artist descriptions, and I'm sure it's very diverse even today. But there, there are some artists for whom the artist description is a really important part of the work of art. There are other, there are other artists for whom they wish they didn't have to produce them. You know, it's a distraction or worse from what they're trying to do. But, but nevertheless, the, the world of art is obviously hugely plastic and diverse, but we could imagine the development of approaches to artistic expression in which people in which it's kind of built into that that we're going to see artistic creation as including inclusion as a part of what the act of creation is and historically we mostly haven't thought that way but to me it's kind of intriguing to imagine what it'd be like i could imagine that there might be important schools of artistic expression where people would really come to embrace that that kind of idea and if, if need be, uh, one could imagine uh, such a movement being fueled by uh, some of the things we were talking about before in the educational setting. You know, broadly similar arguments might be made in the world of creation. And I don't deny that this is weird and might today seem antithetical to many artistic purposes. But hey, time marches on. Maybe we're going to enter a, a cultural regime in, in which those kinds of priorities somehow are valued. Who's got them? Okay. Oh, hi. I'm Justin Swain, and uh, in a former job opportunity, I uh, did uh, database design and analysis and created user interfaces. So as I abstract your presentation, it's basically data input design to aid retrieval, analysis, and report generation in a format desired by or de benefit the individual and user. And it has four major points. One, data collection format and storage, data content analysis and report generation based in part with the use of uh, user profile. The user profile would identify the individual's desired interface for report generation. So that the, it would include uh, formats such as audio, visual, and tactical. Is that a accurate uh, summation? Yeah, that does, that goes, does get a lot of it. So uh, your point about uh, profile or specification based presentation is an interesting one. So many of you will know that uh, an important uh, aspect of the global public inclusive infrastructure initiative that I mentioned is precisely that, that a person could specify uh, things about how they want information presented and how they want to interact with it. I think that the, and, and I think that's that's really important and, and, and valuable. Uh, I think that this, this new paradigm I'm attributing to Raman, although as we've been discussing, it's, it's happening around us without benefit of Raman. Uh, I think that new paradigm goes in a bit different direction. So uh, it's, it's unclear that there's going to be information available to us in a plausible specification somebody might create that would allow us to work out what there is about the content that's of particular importance to them. So I think there's a, there's a difference between this notion of uh, easy creation of clients tailored to people's interests 
that goes somewhat beyond at least the current work on specification-based approaches, in part because of the the space that's opened up in, in this in this emergent view for differences not only in form, which is where the specifications have tended to focus, but to adaptations based on content. So, um, uh, and actually, I guess you know, one fairly mundane example is the personalization example for Social Security, where a presentation is personalized for me not just in terms of what I'm prepared to consume functionally. But what my actual situation is vis-a-vis -vis the services that I need to know about. So, so that's an example of, of something that at least, if we thought in specification terms, that would at least mean that people are going to have many, many specifications, in this case corresponding with agencies they have an engagement with. But, but beyond that, I, th I think one could see that the client somebody created for consuming a particular bunch of content might have many personalizations related to the nature of their interests rather than what their functional abilities would be. But but, but nevertheless, uh, certainly what you describe is, is a part of the picture. Hi, Clayton. Um, this is Debbie Kaplan. Um, it, there are many, many things that have come to mind um, during your talk, but on the whole issue of the the blue button example that you gave, um, and the need for people to come together and figure out a, a policy um, resolution. I'm just reminded um, how often in the history of um, disability public policy and legislation um, there have been proposals to, to make a pretty significant change to how business is done where the first reaction of a large sector of the um, economy is, oh, no, we couldn't possibly do that. And uh, over and over again in accessibility regulation, that's just proven to be not true. There are so many examples. Um, and I think this is another point where uh, uh, there's a need to really look at um, forcing some medicine down people's throats is one way of putting it, which I'm sure private companies would absolutely hate to hear. Um, in accessible transportation, you know, the public transit uh, industry was absolutely convinced that it would be impossible to put ramps or lifts on buses. And now the ramps make it easier for people to board and onboard safely. Um, uh, caption chips on TVs. I mean, yeah. there's so many examples. Um, yeah. And I think that there's a need to get beyond the mindset that accessibility is burdensome, costly, always going to be a big problem and that it has to be fought, um, especially if government's going to require it. Um, because there are many, many examples where it's turned out to actually be beneficial in ways that couldn't necessarily have been anticipated. Um, I once had a, sat at a, at a banquet with a bunch of executives from Macy's in California, and this was a couple years after a large lawsuit that Macy's lost every, every step of the way and fought nonetheless over whether they would have to make their stores more accessible to people who used wheelchairs. And they lost a whole bunch of money losing that lawsuit um, just in their costs for their attorneys. And these guys didn't know that history and were telling me how great it was that their stores were accessible because all their customers just really loved it. And I, I, I was the one who said, well, actually, you guys fought this tooth and nail. Um, there's just countless examples, and I think... You know, we've gotten lazy in a way because of WYSIWYG and aren't thinking through even. I think when you ask people what is the content you're really trying to get at, a lot of people couldn't even tell you. Yeah, I, I agree heartily with all of that. And also, you, you reminded me of something that I meant to stress as, as part of Raman's message that's very uh, much related to uh, your point. And so I was talking before the meeting with a couple of people and they reminded me of this, then I forgot to uh, add it in at the relevant point in the talk. But uh, just following up and amplifying your point, Raman 
uh, again points out that, that indeed, as you're saying, people tend to think of inclusion as some sort of burden, but over and over again, it's shown to be enormously fruitful of creativity. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of literature on that. So creativity comes from uh, thinking about how to deal with unusual cases and the benefits routinely extend beyond those unusual cases that motivated it, uh, it, it to begin with. So, so yeah, that's another part of, of the sort of mutual mindset adjustment that we can all try to cultivate is uh, exactly thinking about inclusive design as an opportunity to do more creative uh, design rather than, oh, somebody's making us pay attention to something that on the whole we'd rather not pay attention to. Uh, actually, I'll just mention something. because it's a, it's a great book if you haven't read it. Uh, uh, Michael Porter's book, The Competitive Advantage of Nations. And I'd love to go on about it, but I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, Porter and collaborators around the world did a very large empirical study of what made industries in particular countries competitive at the international level. And there was a well-established theory of competitiveness that was in place before Porter's book, uh, which was called factor advantage theory. And, and it's one of those theories that seems as if it, it absolutely must be true, so much so that you would never question it. So factor advantage theory says, for example, if you're a country with plentiful supplies of iron ore, then you'll be competitive in industries that use iron ore. Has to be true, right? Well, what Porter reports is, by the end of the study, he said, well, the truth is closer to factor disadvantage theory. Time after time, the, the industries in different countries that established superior commanding positions in international competition were the countries that had overcome obstacles in securing that position. And one of the really entertaining examples, the, it's, it's a big fat book, but it's a page turner. And, and one of the examples is the history of the ceramics industry in Italy, domestic ceramics, tile and stuff like that. So time was when the Italians had to support their, had to import their high quality clay from England because they had only crummy clay in Italy and the English had this great porcelain grade clay. Well now, the Italians are exporting their crummy clay to England. And the reason is the Italians figured out a way to take this crummy clay and make something better out of it. And as part of that, they created a whole new range of clay processing machinery. So now if you're making tile in England, you have to buy Italian machinery and import Italian clay to do it. Okay? So that will stand for many examples. And inclusive design, I think, has much the same uh, potential for us if we if we really allow ourselves to, uh, to, to go there. I think we're going to have to wrap up. Do you have any final words? Well, again, thanks to everybody for the discussion. Actually, I think I neglected to put my contact information up there, which I apologize for, but it's easy. Uh, Clayton.Lewis at Colorado.edu. Or if you just remember that I'm at the University of Colorado and that my name is Clayton, you can probably find me, and I'd love to to hear uh, from any of you to uh, continue the discussion. So thanks to you in the audience and to uh, my hosts. I'm, I'm Karen Peltz-Strauss, and I'm uh, the Deputy Chief here in the Consumer Governmental Affairs Bureau. I want to thank you, Clayton. That was truly extraordinary. Thank you for giving us so much of your time, energy, and resources. Thank you all for coming. I want to mention, um, Jamal asked me to um, mention that we also want to thank Ronald Cunningham and the Technology Experience Center. I also want to thank Jamal and Susan uh, McLean and your entire staff for putting this event on. We've had a great turnout. We hope that the people watching on the web have also enjoyed this as much as we have in the room. We welcome all of you that are here to visit our tech center. Um, it's going to be open as of 1230, so you can get something to eat, and it's just right out of this room. If you exit to the back and make a right and go straight, you will hit, hit it. So thank you again for all attending. Thank you again, Clayton, really, truly, for everything that you do, um, not only your presentation today, but your commitment to these issues is astonishing and, and uh, overwhelming to us. So thank you. And have a wonderful day.